department at Stanford. I was lucky enough to have Joseph Frank as my active emeritus colleague for the first 12 years I spent teaching at Stanford. I was lucky to share undergraduate and graduate students with him, to attend faculty meetings with him, to get to know him and Marguerite, and even to benefit from his advice on my writing. Remember, he told me wisely about my subjects, these 19th century Russian writers were suffering complicated human beings, not just ideas of yours. Now it is my duty to welcome you to today's event in his memory. Before I introduce the music we will hear, I'll tell you about the schedule of today's event. Joe's family and I invited many of his friends and colleagues to speak today, and we were delighted and moved by the response. In order to make sure that there will be time for everyone, we have organized the comments as follows. After the music, the first 10 speakers will come up one by one and speak. I won't introduce them because they're identified in your programs. This will last about an hour and be followed by another musical interlude. After that, we'll move out to the Grove and, um, and we'll all take refreshments. The videographer will move outside with us. And there, the second group of speakers will offer their remarks at the microphone. We anticipate that this too will take about an hour. These speakers are also listed in your program. And you'll see that I will be reading the remarks of my colleague, Grisha Freyden, last. If more of you who are not listed wish to make remarks at that point, the mic will be open. Now, we're about to hear an aria from Act Two of Tchaikovsky's opera, Eugenia Negin, we'll hear Yensky's song, Kuda Kuda Vudaliris. The lyrics are in your program. Marguerite Frank chose this song because she and Joe loved it and used to sing along to it. At the same time, she asked me to point out to you the difference between the song, which is about a life tragically cut short in a duel, and Joe's life which was so long, rich, and full of accomplishments. Yeah. 
no one really could be his enemy. The world of intellectual wisdom and the world of intellectual sympathy has lost one of its great champions, a critic, biographer, and teacher who showed us during an immensely productive lifetime how to bring together in one unified sensibility the virtues of wisdom, knowledge, and sympathy. Yes, sympathy. Indeed, no one was his enemy. We know how rare his sensibility was. It infused all he wrote, theoretical criticism of the highest order, a luminous and distinguished biography of one of the great novelists of the modern world, and essays and reviews across a broad panorama of writers, painters, and thinkers, among them Thomas Mann, Camus, Sartre, Paul Valéry, André Malraux, Ernst Jünger, Gottfried Benn, John Peel Bishop, Cezanne, Goya, Henry James, Lionel Trilling, his Princeton colleague R.P. Blackburn, and his Stanford colleague, the founding director of this center, Ian Watt. Joe Frank thus entered a modern pantheon of intellectuals in every way impressive only to its small membership. We can think of him in the company of M.H. Abrams, Wayne Booth, and Hugh Kenner as theoretical critic, of Richard Elman, John Richardson, and George Painter as biographer, and Frank Kermode as literary essayist. But perhaps his real company, even smaller, is with the masters of disciplines they made their own, political thinkers like J.G.A. Pocock and Quentin Skinner, the musician and polymath Charles Rosen, and the mathematical theorist Benoit Mandelbrot, each a decisive leader in his field. There are others too, but few of any like Joe Frank, who in 1945 at the age of 27 wrote Spatial Form in Modern Literature, an essay that continues seven decades later to guide literary discourse who wrote a biography of a writer whose language, the biographer, with dictionary and grammar in hand, had to sit down and learn, and whose familiarity with European intellectuals of every kind invites us to see him as one of their company, a very small pantheon indeed. Yet to meet him was to encounter a man seemingly unaware of the force of his own achievement and more likely to find out what you were doing and ever so modestly wanting to contribute to your thinking, just by listening and waiting and wanting, if he could, to help. He made what you were doing all the more interesting by virtue of the attention he gave it. Nowhere is this more touchingly witnessed than in his tribute to his wife, Marguerite, in the one volume edition of his monumental biography of Dostoevsky, in which he says, through these many years, she has helped me to maintain my works as close as possible to the highest intellectual and literary standards. In this instance, she was dissatisfied with my treatment of perhaps the most complex of all the female characters in Dostoevsky's novels, the beautiful and ill-fated Nastasya Filipovna of The Idiot. In the past, I had always used her comments to guide my own revisions, but now she so much altered and enriched my own initial view that I asked her to express them herself in the pages devoted to Nastasya Filipovna in the present book thus come from her. Such is the art of paying attention. Such is the virtue of intellectual, intellectual sympathy, testimony to that wonderful virtue of making what you were doing all the better by virtue of the, tension, of the attention he paid to it, could also come today from his students, scores of them, from Minnesota, Rutgers, Princeton, and from 1985 onward here at Stanford. It was our rare good fortune on this campus to know him, to cherish his friendship, to learn from him, and to know while we were in his presence what a genuine intellectual life was and could be. We might say that without him, we are less. But a preferable way of understanding our present lives is to say that because of him, we know how to be better. I am Robert Alter. Um, I uh, became friends with Joe just before he left Princeton for uh, Stanford. 
Um, and I, I just uh, would like to focus on one little detail from when I first encountered uh, Joe. He was, as all of us who knew him uh, recognized, a very warm and generous person. And I'd like to stress for those of you who are not in, in the academic world, that those are not very common traits in the academic world. That there's, what's more common, I will name no names, is to, for the academic in this highly competitive realm to look at others through his eyes that seem like gun slits. Um, and that was the opposite of what Joe was. So, uh, this probably was 1985. Um, I was visiting Princeton uh, to give a couple of talks and um, was introduced to Joe. And then Joe and Gigi invited me over to dinner with, with um, Stanley Korngold, who was a good friend and always a, a delightful presence. And we were sitting around. Uh, and somehow or other, the, um, the name of um, uh, Paul, um, oh, um, and Black and Paul's last name, what? No, uh, you know, this is a, a terrible uh, uh, lapse. Uh, you, you know, who gave the Gauss lectures at Joe's invitation uh, and uh, wrote a book on Whitman. Um, and, oh, this is truly terrible. Uh, yeah, Paul Swag, yes. Now, Paul, Paul and I uh, had been, uh, Paul, Paul actually had recently died of lymphoma, uh, very sadly, at the age of 49. And uh, Paul and I had known each other, not, not well, we became friends afterwards, uh, and when we were classmates at Columbia College. In fact, we both ran on the, the, um, the Columbia College track team. That running might be a little bit of a hyperbole here. I mean, uh, to the best of my recollection, we both came in last uh, regularly in our events, uh, and Columbia was lost. But we, uh, we got good exercise. Uh, and um, in subsequent years, as I said, Paul and I became good friends. Uh, and um, I don't know how uh, Joe had in, uh, initially met Paul, um, but he, he did invite him when he was uh, running the, the Gauss lectures to give a set of, of Gauss lectures. Paul was a very talented person. He was a poet. He was a rather uh, interesting, original uh, critic, and uh, he wrote two remarkable autobiographical volumes. And then Joe said the most simple thing in the world. He said, you know, I miss Paul. And I was startled by this. I mean, people, especially in academe, don't come out with this kind of statement uh, so direct. There's, he was a human being that I cared about, and he's gone, and nothing can replace him. And uh, that was the way Joe related to uh, people, which I will always cherish. And uh, I will say the same thing about Joe, that I'm so, even though he lived, a, unlike Paul, he, he lived uh, to a ripe old age, uh, I'm so sad that he's gone, and I'm missing. I met uh, Joe and Marguerite uh, almost 30 years ago in the mid-80s at Jean-Marie Apostolides' house here in Stanford. And I was really amazed because here was the great Joseph Frank, the author of the special form uh, of the first three volumes of Dostoevsky. And he was so calm and so friendly and so close to his interlocutor. Uh, he told me then how little he believed in the scientific approaches to literature. 
to put it in simple words, how literature is about human beings, not about structures. I saw him again several times, and he and Marguerite mentioned my name to their friends at Princeton, who are looking for a new faculty member and something I really owe them. Uh, and then on the East Coast, he guided me when I had to begin teaching the history of the novel, a uh, topic that he had taught infinitely better for many years. He did something incredibly generous. He let me consult his course plans and his notes. As we know, as a human being, he was kindness and generosity incarnate. And as a scholar, we all know that and deeply admire his monumental Dostoevsky, his essay through the Russian prism, his between religion and rationality. No need to elaborate here. But I want to mention uh, David Foster Wallace's gratitude to Job for having helped many of us see the, the two so-called fallacies, the intentional fallacy and the affective fallacy, are not fallacies at all. Job made us aware that the authors and their craft are there in the works. And we need to meet them, understand them, appreciate them. And that literature is made to move us, to make us feel, to love, and to remember. We love you, Job, and won't ever forget. of students, graduate students, and teaching assistants as I say a few words about the work and life of Joseph Frank as, as I got to know him, first as a student, then as his teaching assistant, and then as a person. <laughs> first, what an admirable scholarly example he has been for all of his students. We all know and love his volumes of the life and works of Dostoevsky and much, much more, but the extent of his achievement was underscored for me by the fact that he had fans sending stamped and self-addressed copies of his latest books so they could complete the set of signed volumes from him. Very few scholars have such ardent fans of their writing. Likewise, I think of when he had reached the culmination of this achievement, publishing the fifth and final volume and completing his life's work the achievement of a lifetime that ensures his scholarly immortality, um, as so many of his works do, and I'm thinking of the uh, five-volume Life and Works of Dostoevsky. And at this point, um, I saw him in the department, and he, reached, he had, by that point, reached the point of asking, um, as we all might hope to, um, so what next? Which I think is a phenomenal place to reach. As a teacher, he delivered fascinating lectures in an old style that I do not find students manage that well, but his students were gripped and engaged, taking notes attentively and asking interested questions. And indeed, these notes, as I know myself, are a tremendous gift to all, ones that I still draw upon with gratitude, and my students benefit from as well, as I teach Dostoevsky now myself. Unbelievably enough, I found that his classes were as interesting the second time around, when I was a teaching assistant, as they were the first, always new facets to explore. And in fact, their breadth and depth, um, one of uh, Joe Frank's sort of signature achievements in his work, I think, provided an ideal intellectual foundation for the kind of comprehensive knowledge of Russian literature required in graduate school or in teaching. Finally, about the life and person of Joe Frank. I wish to know what a kind, generous, and fascinating person he was, especially alongside his lovely wife, Marguerite. I think of delightful dinners and riveting tales of the clandestine literary operations of the CIA in Europe, <coughs> and stories of hitching rides aboard ship across oceans in another era entirely. 
And I want to close by expressing my gratitude, both personally and for many generations of students and graduate students and teaching assistants, for being such a model and mentor and more as scholar, teacher, and person, one whose sage advice and personally his unshakable confidence in me and heartfelt convictions will always be appreciated. Joe said of Dostoevsky's characters applied equally to himself. He possessed immense vitality. Remembering him, I think of Bernard Shaw's life force. After he published his fourth volume, David Foster Wallace, the same essay, worried that there might never be a fifth. And this is a quote from Wallace's essay. Professor Frank must now be about 75, and judging by his photo, he's not exactly hale. <laughs> At which point I interrupt to protest on Joe's behalf that I never saw him looking anything but hale, even when I came out of the library one day and saw him approaching full tilt in a mechanized wheelchair. But Wallace echoed others when he wondered, another quote, whether Frank can hang on long enough to bring his encyclopedic study to a close. In fact, those who knew Joe well might have predicted quite confidently that he would hang on. And of course, he did much, much more than hang on. From start to finish, the Dostoevsky project took something on the order of 40 years. Myself, I often wonder, and, and I really do, how anyone undertakes and sees such a project to an end. True, Joe was not quite alone in what he accomplished. Edward Gibbons, sitting in the Capitoline Hill in 1764, heard the monks nearby singing vesters, vespers and conceived of writing The Decline and Fall, which in the end consumed 3,000 pages, six volumes, and 25 years of his life. Only 25 years because he didn't have to teach and go to committee meetings. <laughs> <laughs> to me, great projects like these are almost more than mortal undertakings requiring more than mortal energy. Joe radiated energy. If anybody ever embodied the mysterious, purposeful, driving force of Shaw's life force, he did. Finally, just a word about Joe, Frank, and Stanford. When he came here, he was well in his 60s. He could have retreated into his study with Dostoevsky, and probably nobody would have blamed him. But that was not at all his way. Instead, he gave himself unsparingly. Despite Stanford's reputation as a technical scientific university, it has had its share of great humanists from the very start, including, I might add, Joe's very good friend, Ian Watt. Uh, Joe joined their company somewhat late in life, but joined them he did, and in every possible way. And uh, like many of you, I've only uh, known Joe and Margaret for five years as a neighbor in nearby Pierce Mitchell. On one occasion, Joe asked me if I knew of a young editor by the name of Carlos Fuentes. He meant, of course, the world-renowned writer. He was joking about his own long accomplished career, implying that he had been an active scholar by the time Fuentes was just beginning to write. Joe was indeed 10 years the Mexican's senior, and Fuentes was actively involved with the Fondo de Cultura Económica, the famous Mexican editorial house. The Fondo published Joe's biography of Dostoevsky in five volumes, translated in many voices by Celia Aide Pachero, Jaime Retif de Moral, and Juan José and Monica Utri. Their influence for Spanish language readers of the Russian master could not be overlooked. 
were stated. Any serious reader can consult this readily available work in Spanish. Fondo books have the ubiquity that penguins have in English. Moreover, the biography, with its combination of literary criticism and what came to be known as cultural studies, has had an influence in Latin America. When it came to thinking about the complex relationship between the revolution and the writer's life, Joe's work proved most enlightening which is why Fuentes, in the prologue to Donald Franker's biography of Gogol, laments that the critic portrays the writer, quote, as he is about to get on his tractor, end of quote. <laughs> the criticism to Franker is a compliment to Joe, who brought nuance to what was, at the time, an us versus them, revolutionary versus reactionary kind of discussion. The chapter image resonated with Che Guevara and the many writers that revolt around him, favorably or not. For his part, the UCLA Mexicanist Martin Feldelton cites Joe's essential spatial form in modern literature in his own influential article, Myth, Contingency, and Revolution in Carlos Fuentes. There he examines, in light of Fuentes' imaginary recreation of the Mexican Revolution, Joe's claim that the disruption of a continuous temporal progression in narrative implies a return to myth. It is a fascinating discussion worth following at another time. My intention has been merely to suggest the impact of Joe's work in Latin America. There, he contributed to Dostoevsky's international standing, but also to thinking about literature and political change, and to offer invaluable critical instruments think about modernism comparatively. Just this last March, the Fontos literary magazine, Gaceta, published Javier Calvo's translation of David Foster Wallace's lucid assessment of Joe's biography. <laughs> so as you can see, the legacies of Foster Wallace, Dostoevsky, Fuentes, and Frank live on, part of the global conversation. I'm John Felstener. I met Joe in 1983. We were year-long fellows at the Humanities Center, at its original place, not here. That year, among other things done, Mary and I drove Gigit and Joe to our favored land in Marin County the Point Reyes National Seashore. Driving up a winding, tree-verged road, toward the top, we rounded a bend, and suddenly, on our left, we encountered a close-by herd of Thule elk, those white-bodied elks seen only in California. As we stopped, I recall hearing some surprised sounds in the back of the car. Maybe those moments made a fresh experience for Joe and Gigit. Soon after, moving from Princeton to Stanford, Joe and Gigit happened to settle nearby, a three-minute walk from us. Now, 30 years have meant regularly irregular get-togethers for every sort of talk, from France and America's troubles and good interests to Gigit and Joe's and Mary and John's troubles and good interests. Among all that, Joe willingly shared his uber-broad literary knowledge and beliefs while he and Gigit cottoned a bit to Mary and me. I just put in a bit, but I'm going to take that out again. <laughs> cottoned to Mary and me. Without really marking it, I felt Joe as a mentor, as well as a quite generous friend. Though Joe was failing for some time, still, his death at the end of February stifled me on the 
very second of knowing it. I felt something utterly loving, yet dark and empty, silent, deeper than sadness. Walking a card to Keats' door, I knew there was nothing to say, and there was everything to say. And down beneath that silent sadness was my deeply subconscious sense from 1983 on that Joe was perhaps a kind of surrogate for my father who had died in 1973. Well, there's been no one like Joe and like you, Gigit, in my life. This will stay strong. What do I want to say about someone who was a strong presence in my life as Joe Frank was? Do I want to talk about the many evenings we shared in which Joe revealed himself as one of the best conversationalists I have ever known? Or do I want to talk about how we exchanged manuscripts over many years, and in my own case with consequences from my own work? After Joe had sent me a piece about attending the performance of Racine's Esther, I reread the play and did my own take in a new book of mine, a book from which Joe read drafts of several chapters, but that sadly I won't be able to present to him when it comes out. So Begit alone will have to accept the copy that I intended for the two of them. But what I most want to discuss as we remember Joe is the power he exercised over me at our first encounter. This encounter, let me add, occurred fully 34 years before I actually met him in person. This was in 1949 when I was taking a senior seminary, senior seminar in literary criticism at Antioch College. In the anthology we were using, I found Joe's essay on spatial form in modern literature, an essay published only four years before. Here was something entirely different from the then reigning new criticism, a mode in which we as students were taught to do intricate verbal analyses of short or brief passages of fiction. What Joe Frank did was something of another order altogether. <clears throat> he was providing a theory, or rather a set of theories, of what constitutes modern literature, of how one can speak of the interaction of the arts, of how such earlier theories of art, like those of Lessing and Hegel, needed to be rethought in light of the then recent achievements of Eliot, Pound, Proust and Joyce. The essay sought to demonstrate how the seemingly temporal form of literature was now assuming the spatial characteristics traditionally associated with the visual arts. To make his larger points, Joe dem demonstrated he could beat the new critics of their own game by providing trenchant analyses, above all, in his long section on Juna Barnes' Nightwood, a novel I'd never heard of and that I later read only because of Joe's advocacy. And his analysis of the Comis Agricole scene in Madame Bovary proved crucial for my own teaching. I quoted from this analysis whenever I lectured on Bovary, right down to the last quarter I taught before my retirement eight years ago. When I first read Joe's essay, I assumed the author was some crotchety celebrity well into middle age. I could never have believed he was only 11 years my senior, and that when he published the piece in 1945, he was all of 27. He could, of course, have rested on his laurels and made a career of writing pieces constituting afterthought to spatial form. But that essay, as we know, was just the beginning. It was, one could say, the pastoral moment in a great trajectory. Once he had passed that moment, he could prepare himself for his grand epic, the Dostoevsky project that was to occupy most of his remaining years. The earliest memories of my father are of his simply being there, 
present, if not actively participating. My father would be reading away, sitting in a chair on a beach towel, with a book, or perhaps two, one being a Russian dictionary. He would be happy to be interrupted to come for a swim, to talk for a few minutes, if we wished, and then would go back to his reading. This sums up my father's remarkably balanced and generous way of living his life. As an intellectual writer, husband, and father, that balance ran through our lives, infusing our summers, vacations, and dinners. He savored life while living the life of the mind. And because his academic life was something he had never expected, my father appreciated it all the more for allowing him to do what he wanted to do. He did not value academic standing or hierarchy in and of itself. This helped him maintain that balance between work and play, university and family, which were interlocking elements rather than distinct parts of his and our life. A perfect embodiment of this was played out every June when we would pack up and go to France either for the summer or for 15 months. My father needed three basic items. The first was a suitcase or a trunk full of books, depending on the length of the stay. The second was a manual typewriter. Once in Rome, this was stolen. My parents spent the day hunting down a replacement, triumphantly returning with a portable Olivetti. A crisis was averted. The third was a portable metal table, usually stored somewhere in France. Armed with these, my father could go anywhere and settle down to work. The mornings were devoted to writing, but after lunch, we would be en famille, with my father reading, but never too busy to be disturbed. My father's sense of balance was one of his most precious gifts. Another was his love of literature. Literature was precious, something to be valued, as well as enjoyed. He and my mother both helped me discover the wonders of reading, a gift that suffuses my life today, just as it did when I was young. Sometimes my enthusiasm got the better of me. Galloping through Jerome K. Jerome's Three Men in a Boat, I mistook the dog for a fourth man. <laughs> my father's astonishment made me realize that perhaps novels were not to be skimmed and misunderstood in this way. And in our own efforts, my father showed me the same generosity and care that endeared him to his students. I'll never forget his saying, a paper of mine written in high school was good enough to be published. I would like to end with one final image. My father enjoyed life and savored the good things. That was part of his wonderful equilibrium, relishing a good meal at a one-star French restaurant as we traveled through the south of France. And when my father was depressed or moody, we knew exactly what to do. Get a good bottle of red wine, put on some Benny Goodman, which, was, which we shall hear later, and dance. He would take turns with my sister and me, putting us on his feet when we were younger, and then teaching us to follow. I'll never forget his saying, just bounce on your knees, be light, and get the rhythm. And he himself, a big man, would look so elegant and light as he twirled around. And now my daughter. There is no ritual. No emotional symbol in the inconsequential moments of the everyday. But these are the ones in which you feel the most encompassed by the love of a family. I think that is why my grandfather's fondest memory was of us walking together. It was 2001 and the entire family was walking back from dinner at my aunt's apartment in New York. Walking with a cane, he was going at a much slower pace than everyone else and had fallen behind. I was heartbroken by his estrangement and abandoned the rest of the group, running back to where he was. We exchanged glances and I reached out to squeeze his hand, letting him know he now had a companion. For the rest of the walk, I meticulously tried to keep the same pace, slowing down my seven-year-old gait until we were in perfect tandem, all the while remaining silent. We just walked. Nothing was said, nothing was done, but neither of us ever forgot it. My favorite memory comes from my own romanticizations of interviews I took with my grandfather. 
not one particular image, but a montage of his life that I had not witnessed, but I had heard secondhand. Many people don't know his life story, and sitting there egging him on, I felt I was privy to a comet or a falling star, and that if I didn't record it, it would all go flashing by. In some ways, I was. Every visit, I would set up my computer and tape him, my grandmother coming in every few minutes to correct him on this or that, a date, a place, a time. <laughs> They had all blended together at that point, but not for me. I was enraptured. I learned he took classes with Martha Graham at the new school after graduating high school, had set up shop at the Library of Congress, and then ventured on to Paris. Then comes the montage of memories he painted for me, illegally riding the freight trains from New York down to Wisconsin because he had no money for a ticket, dancing with army wives, the part-time job having impassioned arguments with Ralph Ellison or Mary McCarthy, or maybe my favorite image, when he saw my grandmother for the first time through a Parisian bus window. She was talking to a friend of his, and he had the gall to get off a stop early and introduce himself. I hope to have half the courage and twice the foolishness that he had. When he died, my mother and stepfather tried to communicate to me that even though he isn't physically here, it's still possible for me to develop that relationship with him through the things he loved. His presence will continue to influence my life, whether that be through his influential essays and books, Dostoevsky, or listening to the classical jazz that he loved so much. And what I've learned in these past few months is that those whom you love never really leave you. They just find new ways of walking alongside you.